Well, good morning, church. Cold, uh, cold day, and for the past days we have a uh, cold night. I was asking some of the brothers a while ago if it is just me that I'm cold. I think the other night we have a uh, two Celsius, and it feels like one Celsius. So that's why I um, woke up around 12 midnight and I was feeling cold. When I look at the temperature, it was two. And there was a, uh, um, what do you call this, a freeze warning. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Brother Todd, for leading us in our singing. And um, before I go with our lesson this morning, I would like to make mention and uh, welcome Brother Paul to back. So um, this morning, we will be continuing our Christ-centered life lesson. <clears throat> and uh, as we all said, um, from the past weeks, we have to live a Christ-centered life in order us to be happy. And just like the song that we sang a while ago, I am happy today. And again, may I ask you, are you happy today? Yes. Good. Good. At least the lesson is sinking through us. So a Christ-centered life it is not a religion-centered life, you know, because a Christ-centered life, it is a gospel-centered life. Okay? You know, the Pharisees during the days of our Lord Jesus Christ, they were very religious. But Jesus, you know, he had a harsh words for them. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 26 and 28, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup, and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You know, a religion-centered life are full of pretensions and hypocrisies, as Jesus mentioned, and which sometimes I like to call this hypocrisy. You know, because this kind of people, you know, they go crazy for attention. They crave for it. So they want honor. They want to be at the center of attraction. They want to be the top of the town, you know, pretending to be pious and righteous. And again, in Luke chapter 20, verse 46, Jesus said, Beware of these teachers of religious law, for they like to parade around in flowing robes and love to receive respectful greetings as they walk in the marketplaces and how they love the seats of honor in the synagogues and the head table at banquets. You know, as we describe or teachers of the law, you know, they parade themselves with such an elaborate dresses, flowing robes, as Jesus mentioned, okay? so as to distinguish themselves from the ordinary people because they clamor for the greetings of the people. You know, as they walk around the marketplace with their robes, elaborate dresses, they were actually waiting for the people, for the common people to greet them. Probably they were walking like this. Good morning. Good morning. You know, so they were actually waiting for it. They want it. Oh, they want honor. You see, because the greetings of the people back then, it was music to their ears. And, you know, projecting that they are superior to the common people and such they demand respect from the people. Unfortunately, my dear brethren, until today, you know, there are some who dress themselves with such decor, you know, and elaborate uh, 
their dresses with inscriptions, whatever they can put on their dresses, whatever signs or symbols they would put on their dresses, you know, to set, to set them apart from, let's say, the regular members of the religious group. And as if they deserve more honor, respect, and recognitions than their regular members, so to speak. But, you know, Jesus, he never wore such dresses. If Jesus is physically here with us today, he would dress just like how we dress. And we like to call it Sunday dress. Just like what you are wearing today. Right? Oh, by the way, before I uh, forget, Jesus is actually here with us today. Physically, he is right there at the back. Brother Jesus, nunag, brother Jesus, nunag. How do you like to pronounce your name, kapatid, brother? Jesus or Jesus? You know, Jesus is what we would say in Tagalog, or sometimes in Spanish they they call it Jesus, but in English, Jesus. Right. So whether we call him brother Jesus or brother Jesus, probably is fine with me. So, <clears throat> and he is dressed. A regular dress, Sunday dress. <laughs> you know, now, if at the start of the service in this congregation, if Brother, if Brother Rex would be standing here and making the announcement, and there will be some visitors that will come in, that visitor, you know, he will not know who the elders are. He will not know who the preacher is because we are all dressed alike. Right? And, uh, <clears throat> you know, the elders, they do not wear, you know, long robes with scarves, with uh, drapes over their shoulders, and you don't see Brother Derek wearing, the, wearing such clothes and, you know, holding the dress like this, walking like this. You know, you don't see him walking like that, right? And the preacher, you know, does not wear any tassels or any togas. So... You see, if someone comes in, everybody will be the same, right? In Luke chapter 11, verse 42, Jesus said, <clears throat> Who to you, Pharisees? For you are careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore justice and the love of God. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things, which is love and justice. You know, a religion-centered life or a, or a self-centered life ignores the things that God valued, such as justice and love. Their motivations are what they can get rather than God getting all the glory, honor, and praise. Not only they want a piece of that glory, honor, and praise that only God deserves, not only a piece of it, but they want the whole of it. They want the whole pie and none to God. And that is what a religion-centered life is. And quite frankly, it's the same with you know, self-centered life. Now, on the other hand, a Christ-centered life is totally a lot different. A Christ-centered life is a life that manifests the values or the virtues it manifests in you the virtues of our Lord Jesus Christ as he now lives in each and every one of you. A Christ-centered life value what God valued. We value justice. We value humility and love, among other things. A person with a Christ-centered life live, we live for the glory of God and not for self-glorification. You know, a religion-centered life focuses on satisfying the approval of their assembly and screens its actions and thinking to the filter of their religious affiliations. Life is viewed in the life or in the light of its <clears throat> affiliation. A self-centered life focuses on satisfying the approval of men and screens his actions and thinking through the filter of self. Life is viewed in the life, in the light of self. 
While a Christ-centered life, it is a gospel-centered. It focuses on satisfying the approval of Christ and screens His actions, His thinking through the filter of the gospel. Life is viewed in the light of the gospel. Now here's a question. Are you a bond servant? The last time I stood before you, we talked about being a bond servant. So are you a bond servant? Now, following the reasoning and the logic that I presented, a bond servant is one whose life focuses on satisfying <clears throat> the approval of their master and screens his actions and thinking to the filter of its master. Life is viewed in the light of its master. Now, if we are a bond servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, therefore our master, your master, is Jesus Christ. Now, changing the word master with Jesus, we now have this. Okay, now, we change the word master to Jesus Christ. So, therefore, a bond servant is one whose life focuses on satisfying the approval, not of man, not of any religious group or organizations, but of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and we screen our thoughts, our actions through the filter of Jesus. And life is viewed in the light of Jesus. So, therefore, a Christ-centered life is a bond servant of life whose life action, <clears throat> what he does, okay, what he does, the way you live, the affairs of your life, the tangibles that can be clearly seen in your life, and what he thinks, what you think, your motivations, your judgment, your heart, the intangibles that only God can see, <clears throat> and that most of the time reflects through our doings and through our actions, we screen it through the filter of the word of Christ, which is the gospel. <clears throat> so a bond servant, as bond servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, we eat, we sleep, and breathe the gospel. Philippians chapter 1, 27, whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. Now, the gospel has now become a very important part of your existence, of our existence. <clears throat> that leads to our salvation. Now, the gospel being so important in us, Jesus now gives you. Jesus is giving you, yeah, all of us, all of you, a mandatory command. A mandatory command to have that gospel that is in you to spread it through all humanity by means of preaching and sharing the gospel, preaching and sharing Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 28, as we are all familiar with it, the Great Commission, <clears throat> Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So as a bond servant, like you and I, as bond servant, we have a marching order <clears throat> from our master to go. Now what does it mean when God said go? The word go <clears throat> means that we are to perform a specific task duties. The word go means you have accepted Christ and his commands. You will not be a part of that great commission if you have not accepted the Lord. But since you have accepted the Lord, then Jesus is talking to you. The word go, 
excuse me, carries with it an important message and command of the master, and in this case, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word go is all inclusive. <clears throat> it is not gender-based. What do I mean by that? It's not only for men. It's not only for women. <clears throat> it is for everybody. It is not positional base. The word go is not only for the elders, not only for the deacons, not only for the ministers, the preachers. No. It's for you. And it's for me. The word go <clears throat> does not confine us to a specific place, but covers the whole earth wherever our feet, our feet brings us. It means that you have to share the gospel, to preach the gospel, not only to your house, wherever you go. <coughs> Excuse me. The word go denotes an ever forward motion. It does not stop. The word go is a command to follow and not an option to obey. You see, the fulfillment of this great commission therefore can only be achieved by advancing the gospel by you and i living a gospel centered life so how do we advance the gospel <clears throat> how do we advance the gospel number one there is the urgency of the gospel in John chapter 9, verse 4, Jesus said, We must quickly carry out the task assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming, and then no one can work. We see, Jesus, when he was here on earth as a servant, there was a task given to him by the Master, by God the Father. And there was an urgency for that task. Likewise, we as servants are sent by our master. We are sent by our Lord Jesus Christ. And there was also an urgency for our commission. Remember that go means that there is a task, that there is a duty that you have to perform. Now, it says there quickly. Quickly demonstrate, you know, it means that one is in a hurry. You have to speed up because you see an urgency. When someone said quickly, you know, you have to move fast, right? Come on, run. Not slow motion, right? You don't have to slow move. It means that you have to move faster, move quickly because there is an urgency. Urgency means requiring a swift action. Because it is important. Now, the urgency is death. Because death is inevitable. We don't know when our time will come up. And Jesus knew that. His life will soon be taken away from him. So he was in a hurry to carry out his task. Share what he had. That's why he said the night is coming <clears throat> and then no one can work. Now, two things we need to realize in this. Number one is that a reminder for you as a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ that your life will come to an end, which you do not know when. Therefore, you must quickly act to carry out your task. That's number one. Now, number two that you have to remember, a reminder for you as a servant that life of other people as well will come to an end. So therefore, you have to act quickly to carry out the, thing, the task to bring what you have to those who are not yet saved so that they too can be saved just like you. So the realization is this, my dear brethren, that both your time and the time of the unbelievers 
<coughs> will come to an end. So you have to discharge your duties quickly. Because you have accepted the Lord and therefore you have that marching order from God to share the gospel, to preach the gospel before it's too late for you and before it's too late for that person, the unbeliever. So remember that go means you have accepted Christ and, that, and by accepting Christ, it comes with it, the responsibility of sharing the gospel. Now, Brother James, we echoed this principle by our Lord in James chapter 4, verse 14. You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. If we don't see the urgency in preaching the gospel, to be honest with all of you, there is something wrong with us. There is something wrong with us. There is something wrong with me if I do not see any urgency of the gospel, of sharing the gospel. According to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it. How terrible for me if I did not preach the good news. Such a huge word from Brother Paul. If we don't get the meaning of his word and still be lazy, we are not truly a bad servant of God. He said he was compelled by God, as we can read. Meaning he was duty bound because there was a need a necessity to preach the gospel. Now, the duty-bound Paul was brought about by love. His being a bond servant was brought about by love for our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember the last time we talked about a servant who chose to be a bond servant for life because of his love for his master. Now, Paul was a bond servant for life. He was duty-bound because he loved the Master. He loved our Lord Jesus Christ. And he loved his fellow. That's why he made this empathic statement upon himself when he said, how terrible for me if I did not preach the good news. If we are not shaken and awakened by this message of Paul, I do not know why. Now, second, the word go against, uh, again means that in our hands, in your hands, there is an important message from our master to convey to others. That's why there is a call for urgency. So what is the importance of the message? The important message of Christ Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone believing, both to Jewish first and to Greek. I want everybody, I want all of us, even those in our Zoom, you know, please look at your hands. I didn't look at your hands. Come on, look at your hands. Look at your hands. Look at the palm of your hands. Okay? What do you see? Now, look at those hands. For those who have accepted our Lord Jesus Christ and that you consider yourself as servants of God, I want you to see and realize that in those hands of yours, okay, I want you to see that Jesus, our master, your master, entrusted you with something that has a life-changing message. Now, look at your hands again. In those hands brings salvation. Oh, not, not you. But it is, of course, with our Lord Jesus Christ. But as a bond servant, you have that standing command from God 
to share the gospel. Now, in your hands is a life-changing message which spells the difference between heaven and hell for someone else. And that person or that someone else may be your wife, may be your brother, your sister, your relatives, your friends, your workmate, or just any random person that you will meet in your life. And for those of you that not have accepted, have not yet accepted the Lord, would it be great for you that in those hands of yours, you will be a part of something significant that at the end of your life, you will greatly be rewarded by God, the kind of which none of us have never seen before. Now, Apostle Paul opened up in verse 16 of Romans chapter 1 by telling us that he is not ashamed of the gospel. It means that Paul was so proud of the gospel that this master entrusted to him. Now, let me tell you and let me ask you, are you proud of the gospel that is in your hand right now? Are you proud of it? You can feel the excitement of Apostle Paul bringing the gospel to everyone. You know, like Paul, we must be proud of the gospel. We must glory in the gospel. As we are proud of it, we must share it. We must preach it. Why? Why do you have to preach the gospel? Why do you have to share Jesus Christ? Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It means without knowing the gospel, one cannot have faith to that which God the Father had made to be the propitiation for our sins, which is Christ Jesus. And therefore, one cannot be saved without God. And it is only by the gospel that everyone who believes in its message and trusting their life to Jesus Christ will be saved. Now, then Paul said that salvation is for everyone. It is for everyone. You don't choose whom to preach the gospel. You preach the gospel to anybody. You don't have to choose. Now, so how can you not be proud of that? How can you not be proud that you are part of the elite men and women of our Lord Jesus Christ that are continuously changing this world to become a better place for all of us by bringing the gospel that transforms humanity into a Christ-centered human being. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, as we advance the gospel, anywhere is a pulpit to preach the gospel. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Now, what was Paul talking about when he said, what has happened to me? What did happen to Paul and what circumstance was he in when he said this? What happened to Paul was he was in prison for preaching the gospel of his master. Paul was in prison in Rome when he said this. And in fact, he was in prison while he wrote the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Colossians, and Philemon, the four which are called the prison epistles. Now look at this. He said, what happened, whatever happened to him, his imprisonment has actually served to advance the gospel. Now again, what is Paul talking about? How was his imprisonment advanced the gospel? In, let's move in Philippians chapter 1, verse 13. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. You know, Paul's imprisonment did not stop him from spreading the gospel. You know, the Roman government thought that they could stop Paul that they could silence Paul by putting him in prison, in house arrest. No, they were 
totally wrong. Okay? For Apostle Paul, anywhere is an opportunity to preach the gospel. You know, Paul find ways how to advance the gospel. His imprisonment, his imprisonment was actually a big pulpit to preach and advance the gospel. Now, how is that possible? How is that possible that Paul uses his being imprisoned to preach the gospel? You know, Paul was under house arrest for two years and under the watchful eye of a Praetorian guard, palace guard, as they call it. But it, was, it is the Praetorian guard. And the Praetorian guard, they are the elite force of the emperor. They numbered from nine to 10,000 soldiers. Okay? So Apostle Paul, he was chained to one Praetorian guard 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If he had to go to the bathroom, the Praetorian guard must go with him. If he have to change, the Praetorian guard is with him. So he was chained to a Praetorian guard 24-7. And as one research said, that every four hours, the Praetorian guard changed shift in guarding pole. Now, here is the thing. Paul has a captive audience. Paul has a captive audience. Can you imagine? You do the math. If the Praetorian Guard changes shift every day, four hours a day. So 24, 24 hours divided by four, that is six. Six times 365 times two years. So that's how many guards that guarded Apostle Paul. Now, under that house arrest, you know, Paul had a bit of freedom. He welcomed visitors. He preached with those visitors. And while preaching, the Praetorian Guard, you know what? <laughs> they were listening to Apostle Paul. You know, they cannot do anything but to listen Apostle Paul preach day in and day out, sing day in and day out, pray day in and day out. That's why Paul said that his imprisonment had actually been for the advancement of the gospel. Wow. And he said that the whole palace guard, the whole Praetorian guard, 9,000 to 10,000 strong soldiers and even everyone else, including the families of those guards, they have heard the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, all God's people here send you greetings, especially to those who belong to Caesar's household. Did you hear what Paul said? Did you hear what Paul said? There are now God's people, there are now brothers and sisters that belongs to the household of the emperor. Wow. You see? Now the household means those who work at the office for the emperor. It includes high-ranking officials from the top brass down to the freedmen, to the slaves. Though it was never mentioned there who they were. Now, praise God, because Apostle Paul was in prison and the gospel was preached inside the heart of Rome, reaching the corners of the palace and many were converted. Now, here's the question. Who is then is the real prisoner? Who is the real prisoner? Was it Paul or was it the Praetorian guards? Was it their families? was it the household of the emperor whom Paul take captives with the gospel of Christ. You see, brethren, the word go again in the Great Commission does not confine us. It does not confine us to a place, to, to a specific place to preach the gospel. It does not confine you to your homes 
alone, to your friend's home alone, to our workplace alone, but it is everywhere where there are souls to be won. God denotes an ever forward motion. It does not stop. Paul did not stop to preach even while in prison, even while chained to a guard. Since there were souls to be won around him, he moved on and preached the gospel. What he saw was an opportunity for the gospel to reach the inner walls of those who opposed the gospel of Christ. And then by the grace of God, Apostle Paul won many souls for Christ. How awesome was that? Now before I end, there is a question. Just to break the ice. Question, what phenomenon is called where a chained pole converted his captors? It is called chain reaction. Now, finally, let me just be quick on this. As we share the gospel, now please bear with me for a couple of minutes. Remember this. Four W's and one H. How? How you preach the gospel is all up to you. Be creative. You can do door knocking, old school type. You can share it in social media. It's all up to you. Where? Where to preach the gospel and share Jesus Christ is anywhere. The world is your pulpit. In your workplace as long as there are souls. When? When to preach the gospel is any time. Any time is the best time to preach the gospel. What? What to preach? What to share? Tell them your story. Tell them why you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell them why you are a bond servant of Jesus. Now, by telling them your story, you are telling them who Jesus Christ is. Now, here's the most important question. Why? Why are you sharing the gospel? This is where it all matters. Your answer to this question will make all the difference in your life. Why do you need to advance the gospel? Why do you need to go? From the biblical perspective, I have shown you all the reasons why. It is now your turn to answer it truthfully. Remember, you cannot fool God. So answer truthfully with yourself. Now, Paul's chain did not stop him from doing his service. God. Now let us join Paul as he proclaimed the kingdom of God and thought about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Now brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. I'm making an appeal, a plea to all of us to continue to live by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Share the gospel. I call on to those who have not yet accepted Jesus Christ. It is a great privilege, privilege to serve our loving God. Now, why not come today and wash away your sins? Now, may I ask everybody to stand up as we sing the song of invitation.